So thanks very much for sticking with carbon. I mean, I know you can eat hazelnuts and you can't eat carbon, but if you have a good carbon program, carbon makes oxygen, and that's very handy for people. <laughs> All right, so I'll let you start. So we're going to cover, in the biggest sense, uh, the carbon cycle, so you're clear what we're talking about. We're going to get into uh, carbon sequestering and how that could fit potentially with agroforestry. Um, uh, a lot of the carbon uh, efforts in the world are on a voluntary basis, so we'll talk about that and then we'll get into carbon offset uh, markets as well. Thanks. So uh, there's a lot of students here, so you probably know this slide in various, uh, in various forms uh, intimately anyway, um, but uh, basically this is the, um, a schematic of the, the natural um, carbon cycle. Uh, where we're at uh, basically uh, today. Um, uh, one thing of notice, you know, we always talk about land systems, but you can see the numbers for uh, sequestering in oceans is uh, significantly more than all the land mass of, of Mother Earth. So something not to, to forget in the biggest sense. Next. So this is our current uh, situation with the industrial um, uh, carbon cycle. Um, these are the... Um, um, the increasing carbon at about 3.2 gigatons every year. We've got uh, um, contributions from all of our human activity of around 8.3 that goes. The land masses are uh, eating uh, around 1.4 gigatons. Oceans a bit more, 1.7. We even have fugitive carbon, which can be a whole topic. Uh, scientists don't even know where another 2 gigatons is going. But in the bottom line, 3.2 is added every year, and uh, the connection with global warming and all these kinds of things are um, uh, kind of settled these days. So um, first thing in a carbon strategy that you're thinking, either personally or um, as a small company or a larger um, organization, is what's your, your carbon footprint. So we played around with some, uh, uh, some numbers. Uh, my personal uh, carbon footprint uh, is uh, 5.9 um, uh, tons of CO2 equivalent per year. Um, I'm not big on flights. I drive uh, 400k and you can see the other um, uh, influences on my footprint. Um, Taylor, on the other hand, the model young citizen like you young students or whatever um, to follow, um, at uh, only 1.09 uh, tons and uh, um, strategies or whatever of uh, even with some some flights or whatever minimizing uh, other aspects uh, can se severely reduce carbon footprint compared to the average British Columbian. Yeah. Yeah. My carbon footprint actually doubled because I went to Hawaii this year so just that flight like increases a lot. But compared to the average British Columbians, which is 11 tons, so we're doing pretty good. <laughs> um, and then when you, you put that on a larger scale to a farm or a small business or whatever, um, agriculture is like about 10 to 12 percent of greenhouse gases um, um, emitted by humans over the whole globe. So that's a pretty big, big chunk. Um, but I was interesting when I was reading up, up on this, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change actually recommends agroforestry as a mitigation option for um, agriculture operations. So that was cool to see. Um, you guys, I think this was sent out to you in uh, an email prior to the conference, but this is just a, a carbon footprint calculator for farms that we found that's super handy. I think it's out of the UK, so there might be a few discrepancies, but it's, you know, it incorporates a lot of factors that um, are present on a farm, so you can get a good idea of what's actually going on in your own operation. Um, and other than that, you know, you people are usually paying companies to assess their carbon, so this is a good way to get a, you know, an overview of what you have going on. Um, I've got the, if you just Google C plan, or you'll find it in, this, in the presentation after, so you guys can take a look at that. So, um, you know, why carbon and, and agroforestry? It was uh, I'm pleased to hear the, the presentations this morning that uh, touched on and mentioned and in the groups or whatever 
Um, there was a touching on carbon as a uh, as a possibility to incorporate within your um, within your business. Uh, carbon is um, uh, certainly um, uh, a key piece of a corporate social responsibility policy that your organization uh, might be looking to embrace. That's why I asked the question this morning as to whether or not, uh, from a business uh, perspective and business planning perspective, is uh, embracing corporate social responsibility, of which carbon would be one of those pieces, can that make your organization or your business more profitable? And in the most general sense, uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, uh, continuing. So, um, just so you uh, have a, an overview, some people are not even completely clear, like, what the hell would that actually even look like? So when we're looking at where carbon is actually se uh, sequestered, in um, it can be in trees, but it could be in tall shrubs or shrubs. Anything that's accumulating woody um, material um, is an obvious uh, uh, addition of carbon. Another piece that's uh, often overlooked is there's a lot of, depending on the soil type, um, there's a lot of uh, carbon sequestered in soil as well. It's very complex to calculate that because you can imagine how many different kinds of tree species and shrubs might grow on an individual bit of soil, but it's all, that's why we have these young, wonderful minds in the room are supposed to be going to go work all this out for me so I don't <laughs> have to figure it out myself because it's quite um, complex. And uh, of course on the other side with agricultural crops, anything that uh, you put back in that actually gets composted from the residual that isn't actually used for, um, uh, for sale, um, that's at the, uh, at the opposite or the negative end of, uh, of carbon because anything that's composted is releasing carbon again and so you don't get any gain or whatever from that. And that's why things like no-till farming is a, is a very specific concept that can be used for carbon offsetting because you're not tilling that material back into the soil. Okay? All right. So um, if you're wanting to, you know, adapt a carbon strategy a plan, there's two levels. So the first one we kind of mentioned is voluntary. So you're just doing it for, you know, a few different reasons. And the second higher up is looking into the carbon market. So we'll start with the first level, voluntary commitment. So if you, if you have an agroforestry operation, you're going to be sequestering carbon um, anyways because you have the trees on the land, so you, you, know, you might as well make a plan to, to make the most of it. Um, you'd want to do this to reduce your own carbon footprint and you know, emit less for social responsibility, as we mentioned, and you can also use it as a you know, marketing your product because people are interested in buying products that are green and sustainable uh, and so on. So um, this part of the carbon um, aspect, the carbon reduction and the sequestration um, plan, um, you can't just take all of the existing trees that are growing on your land. You have to actually make a, um, a plan um, for them. You want to know what your emissions are, of course, to start with. Um, you want to be reducing your emissions, your footprint, so, you know, a kind of examples of those or whatever, you hear the different things from BC Hydro and putting in certain light bulbs and all these kinds of things. But you also are, would be looking at your um, options. Um, for example, greenhouses, uh, anything that would be heated with uh, the agricultural residues or with wood that's uh, uh, not being used uh, as fossil fuels, um, using solar energy and all of these ideas are all helping to reduce your footprint. And then in the end or whatever, you want to be looking at your overall um, plan of strategy um, for selecting tree species, agricultural crops, all these different kinds of things that are going to be able to complement the overall carbon reduction and sequestration plan. So um, in the um, one example from that would be the debris from uh, the pruning of planted trees. So if you're taking that kind of material uh, mixing it with your other agricultural waste, uh, even the uh, if you have cattle and these kinds, horse, all these different kinds of things, all of those wastes, you know, when they're dried, can be used for bioenergy. 
Um, if the trees are grown to maturity, as we saw in the examples uh, this morning with the, with the black walnut, you can create a very valuable product and um, put that wood into making furniture, and then that carbon is sequestered for a much longer time than uh, some of the other products that can come from trees. Then uh, we seem to be coming back again to this corporate social responsibility. Um, uh, a lot of the smaller clients that I work with are um, primarily interested in the corporate social responsibility aspect of things. So they want to get an idea of their footprint and then use the strategies or whatever. Um, but they're primarily using the strategies to be able to put up on their website you know, that we're uh, working towards becoming a carbon neutral company. We're using strategies or whatever to reduce our carbon footprint. And they're using it, uh, you know, they, um, just like I was saying, uh, sharing at the table, you know, uh, um, uh, this morning, uh, uh, David had a, a, a slide of a J Springs uh, lamb. Uh, in our presentation, we have one of J Springs lamb. If you're going to go out and buy lamb and you know it's at the Vancouver farmer's market, you're probably going to go and buy their product as opposed to someone else's. So that's a, a good example of uh, CSR in action. So uh, this is one uh, of the many uh, examples. It's a hybrid poplar. Uh, I work a lot with hybrid poplar. Um, this one here is very, very simple or whatever. It's just hybrid poplar and chickens. <laughs> and then again, there's a J Springs Ranch. So uh, uh, David mentioned they're using um, the forests from the, uh, the Crown Woodlot um, to graze sheep. Um, and uh, then in turn harvest the, the trees on the woodlot. I also planted uh, 20,000 trees on these pastures um, uh, as a carbon offset uh, as well. And uh, the, uh, um, the, the sheep that were there, yeah, we, the, some seedlings were lost, but in the most general sense, now the seedlings are up at four or five feet high. Um, they're on their way and uh, they're still adequate to grazing. Over time, the trees would be selectively um, harvested to let, let enough sunlight down and to continue the forage that's there. This is another example from one of my travels. This is uh, New South Wales, Australia. Um, this is uh, peaches. Um, the whole area is uh, like a greenhouse and covered, um, so they grow vegetables. Uh, um, for this uh, community on the, uh, on the lower levels um, and they also have chickens that go throughout the whole garden as well. <coughs> oh yeah, and then this is the same, the same slide that we saw this morning from Iowa. So if you, I guess you were going to go and learn about uh, riparian buffers, I guess a road trip to Iowa is, because um, this is the one that we found as well, um, these riparian buffers with trees, shrubs, native grass, and then eventually the, uh, the agricultural crops. So tremendous benefits for um, habitat and its carbon sequestration. All right, so the second level, if you want to, you know, probably if you're a larger operation and you want to take it a step further, is to look into the carbon offset market. Uh, it's fairly complicated and there's a lot going on. Um, but basically, you know, if you're a larger scale farm or even if you're a group of farms close together, like to going into like a carbon cooperative, uh, there is the potential for it to be profitable for you. Um, but the benefits are small per acre per year of the carbon that's being sequestered. So you definitely need like a bigger group of organizations. And standards and certification is required. So there's a, a definitely a cost to that part of it. Um, so what is a carbon offset in the general sense? It's an emission reduction credit from an orga organization's project that results in less CO2 or other greenhouse gas in the atmosphere than would otherwise occur. So here's a little diagram. Um, so a company A, so a big, say a pulp mill or something, um, needs to meet its emission cap. So it will invest in a company like a farm that's you know sequestering carbon, um, and they that's producing a carbon offset, and that is in turn a carbon credit for um, the larger, dirty company. <laughs> Um, I'll let you talk about the certification. Yeah, so it, it's not really a simple, straightforward uh, process um, to get these uh, credits. 
understandably, in the world of carbon credits, there's been a lot of fraud and a lot of uh, projects or whatever that went just a little, you know, a little bit too crazy, like Coldplay. Um, I guess they paid a bunch of money as a, as a, uh, um, to get some carbon credits going in Africa, and what a surprise or whatever, a couple of years later, all the trees had died and um, there was no carbon being sequestered. So this uh, third-party independent verification, um, companies like PricewaterhouseCoopers and others and KPMGs, they go and they do a third-party um, certification, and you can imagine the costs of that are astronomic. Um, it's all a voluntary um, uh, carbon market as well. Um, the, the issues that they're dealing with, which you would do too even on a smaller kind of basis, it must be additionality. So in the city of Vancouver, the trees they plant every year on the boulevards, if they always plant 5,000 trees, if they, even if they made a plan, they, st they plant 5,000 trees next year, that's not a carbon sequestration. They've got to plant 10,000, then they can claim 5,000. Then you're doing it against the baseline. So all of the carbon that you're currently sequestering, if, uh, the trees in your current hedgerows, etc., those don't count as well. You have that baseline and you have to go above your baseline. Then you have to have a carbon management plan that's blessed and approved by, if it's the city of Vancouver, that would be um, the council would have to pass that plan. And then the third party independent monitoring um, at certain specific is, uh, intervals to actually get at exactly what additional efforts have been made related to carbon sequestering. And there are definitely or specific carbon trust and in BC. Yes, at the back. I'm curious to know, like, uh, say with the city of Vancouver, when they go uh, and cut down a bunch of trees, is that taken into the equation? Yeah, well, that would be, yeah, that, that would be part or whatever of this uh, third party independent verification. If, if, um, <clears throat> if each year they always seem to cut down a thousand trees, so that would be in the baseline. So then, it's a matter of, and the, the trees that they cut down are just, you know, sent to the garbage dump. If they then in turn or whatever took those thousand trees, they cut them down, but they sent 500 of them to the sawmill and, and furniture was made, then that's an improvement in the overall carbon uh, process. But if they did the same old thing year after year, then um, that would be covered in the baseline. So it's a pretty complex piece of, uh, of work and you know, there's people who um, full-time, that's all they do is work on carbon sequestration and these baselines and all these, all these processes. So there is a, a, um, there's a specific carbon trust, which is a British Columbia quasi-government organization where um, you send them your application that you're going to do all this carbon sequestering on your land and they bless it and they pay you money for it. Um, um, it's even in debate as to whether they should even keep the thing going. So you can check that out. There's another company here in Vancouver, well-known, well-respected, called Offsetters. They come into your organization and uh, they do your carbon footprint and then they make a carbon plan and they basically manage your whole uh, carbon uh, uh, program or whatever for you. There is actually two farms <coughs> in the valley, um, both called Sun Select, and they have a plan. They're they have carbon offsets through offsetters, and they have, it's not agroforestry, but they take the biomass from pruning, and they have a biomass burner system set up, and they all, they have, um, they work with this other engineering firm who's created this thing that takes the direct carbon out of the, what's coming out from burning the biomass, and that direct carbon is being put into their greenhouses, so the vegetables that they're growing can absorb the pure carbon that's coming out and they're getting offsets from that program. It's interesting. So, summary, um, uh, you know, if you're um, doing agroforestry or thinking to head that way, um, sequestering um, carbon, um, uh, let's talk or take advantage of it. So you have the two pieces again, you have the, the voluntary aspect of things where um, it, you're putting it towards your uh, corporate social responsibility, you're putting it towards your, your marketing, and uh, uh, you think or whatever that that's a, um, a good way to conduct your business. 
Um, the second aspect, if you're larger or can, you know, uh, create a cooperative, um, just like in the, the business scenario, um, the cooperatives of those different organizations that you might want to create or belong to, those as a group, uh, you know, like the Woodlot Associations and things like that, they could uh, create a large enough uh, uh, amount of potential carbon credits and go for um, uh, recovering uh, money or funds directly from those. All right. Thanks very much. Awesome.